here's your host, Alex Garrett. Well, on this edition of Adapting with Alex Garrett, I got to first give a shout out to David Oliva and his brother, Chris Oliva, as they introduced me to my next guest. You might hear him uh, with CUNYAC, the CUNY Athletic Conference. You might hear him doing St. John's. You might hear him pretty much almost everywhere, it feels like. Ralph Benarchik, a broadcaster and an adapting announcer. I'll tell you why in a bit. But, Ralph, this has been a long time coming, and it was great to finally meet you a couple weeks ago. Absolutely, Alex. Uh, I, I knew it was you when I saw you, but I was, of course, busy broadcasting the game. Uh, but, uh, yeah, yeah, it's still great to finally connect. And, yes, uh, Dave and Chris Oliva uh, should get tremendous credit uh, for uh, years ago connecting us. And so, and, and credit is where credit's due. And we'll talk about the game we were at because it's a special kind of thing. And I have a couple former uh, schoolmates from the Viscardi School on that. But adapting as an announcer, not just sports-wise, sport to sport, but now we're dealing with a pandemic. And so let's start there. You just told me that things are really, you know, it, it's not easy right now. So adapting to this wave of COVID, is it any different to the last time, like when real cancellations were happening last year? Uh, It's about the same. Uh, Things are happening uh, basically by the day, and uh, any game that happens at this point, uh, I don't know, I don't think this is going to be this way for the spring. I think this is more of like a hot period that we're looking at, but uh, I think this is a situation where every game you get through, you consider that a blessing, Uh, and, and that's it and um, uh, take it day by day. Uh, We try to get through it. Uh, It did seem, like, for example, the February and early March spring 2021 cancellations were much higher than it was in April and May. So as we went on, so I I think that that will will also be the case here. Well, let's talk about March 2020. Obviously, you're you're in the stride for broadcasting. We're about to hit the March Madness in all the divisions, by the way. And then all of a sudden, it just shut down. And I, I don't know. I know you like that political, but let's talk about career-wise. What was that first like? Because um, I think people want to know, what are these broadcasters going through day in and day out during a pandemic starting in 2020? Yeah, you're just you're hoping for every broadcast uh, to happen. Uh, but you have to know uh, that – you have to be very flexible and ready to move. Uh, as things change, game times change, uh, you just have to be super flexible and take whatever's there. Uh, if every game happened, uh, I'd be thrilled. Uh, but, you know, we were operating uh, through the fall. Like, for example, the fall was like a uh, 98% uh, uh, ninety-eight execution uh, where very little got canceled. Uh, so obviously here in the winter time, because this is a, the virus is seasonal, uh, you know, despite what people may or may not think about it, it is seasonal. So of course cases are going to be higher, uh, just because of that, uh, because where we are on the calendar. Uh, so you got to be flexible and prepared, uh, to move. And, um, and it also makes you think, you know what, when the work is there and the games are there, you got to take everything when it's there because you just don't know, uh, when you can go through a dry spell. Well, it's interesting because uh, a couple of years ago, you mentioned to be grateful being on the air, and you, you see guys like Tom Brenneman, great broadcaster, but sometimes people say something like, you have the opportunity to be on air. Why are you saying that stuff? But that's another conversation for another day, unless you want to weigh in on that type of thing too. Like, when knowing these games may not happen, it makes every word matter even more, doesn't it, on the air? Of course it does. Uh, and, uh, and I think all these athletes uh, have to know that too. Uh, that uh, all the games you play, uh, you just don't know if you're gonna if your next game might not be for two weeks, and it's not just the next game you play, but uh, what kind of condition is your team gonna be in? Uh, like a, a stoppage could wreck a season, so you better take every game and every practice seriously, uh, because you just you just don't know how significant that game is gonna be, uh, because you you may have a chunk of your schedule wiped out. And then what? And then you're going to wish, you know, I, I wish we took those games even um, extra seriously that we did play. Uh, because when you play or however, however many games you have, you're thinking about playoffs or whatever you are. Uh, and uh, that changes your perspective. Well, 
it, it, had you seen teams in the fall, I know you say it was 98%, but were there any teams on a hot streak and then all of a sudden, like, their soccer program, their um, – what else goes on? Well, mainly soccer goes on in the fall. Track and yeah, it, w- it wasn't really – you know, like, for example, St. John's women's soccer lost the game. Central Connecticut State had virus issues. I can think of, um, uh, you know, there was some non-conference volleyball game canceled or, or moved. So it it wasn't, you know, it was it was 98%. So in the grand scheme of things, it did not affect uh, those seasons. Uh, I think uh, all playoff games happened. Uh, nobody from New Jersey or Long Island High School or anything I heard of, you know, had their season stopped and, and uh, people declared, you know, winners by forfeiture. None of that happened. It was just uh, uh, it was just the occasional cancellation here and there that occurred, uh, and even some of those got made up. Well, we cannot talk about Big East basketball without mentioning the fact that St. John was supposed to play Seton Hall a week ago. You know, on a, a Monday the twentieth, that got wiped out because of COVID within Seton. And you're probably following these teams closely. Seton mm-hmm. Hall had this incredible run leading to the Big East. Tur- you know schedule and now who knows how they play right that's going to be a big question mark moving forward I no think. no doubt that's i mean look specific. i mean look look at baylor look at when baylor last year uh had their shutdown they came back they lost the game and eventually won the national championship uh but baylor it took them some time to kind of get back to the level uh that they were playing out uh before the shutdown uh so it is it is just hard you know to be away for 10 days now these shutdowns aren't as long or, or aren't, it seems, as disruptive. Now, St. John's men's basketball, for example, they just lost, uh, let's see, so their last game was, uh, was what, last Sunday, the, last Saturday the 18th. And now their games against Marquette and Georgetown are postponed and have a Butler game canceled right before Christmas. So, so their next game right now is, I guess, January 4th or 5th. So they're going to go from the 18th to like the 5th without playing. Um, look, that's, you know, that, that's a long time. So they're going to definitely be impacted by, by that. Uh, now, I think they're all practicing uh, compared to other teams that went a long time without practicing. So, um, yeah. Uh, and Ralph, when you think about that game, that game against Pitt, they, they could have had a win. It was a bad loss, wasn't it? Against well, there at the well it, it, yeah, it, certainly it was because Pitt, you know, Pitt is a bottom – four or five ACC team, but they were playing without Julian Champagny, who was out with the virus. So, uh, so it, it's still, it's still a major problem, but it still shows you how great of a player he is. Uh, and, and also uh, that the rest of the team uh, needs to develop in a big way, but they, uh, they need, uh, they need to rise up another level and not rely on his 21 points and him playing great A plus basketball, the way he is every game against quality competition. So, uh, that's what I think they need to conclude off of that game. And Posh is still there, right? That that that. Oh yeah, Posh Alexander. Yeah, yeah, Posh, and Posh is still there. Yeah, the rest of the team is healthy. Uh, it's just that you know, look, they scored whatever 55 points without Julian Champagny against a you know bottom four or five pit team uh, in the mm-hmm. ACC. You know that at the Garden, that's the game that uh, a, you know a team that feels that they are quality wins even without their best player. You know, but they didn't. So that's that's also I think it, it concludes that uh, they rely on Julian a little bit too much, and they need to take that message. The rest of the guys uh, need to take that message with them. Rob, I got to ask you uh, because you're in on this, you've seen it day in day out. You mentioned that Champagne had it, but not many other. But I don't know anybody else on St. John's. So what's the protocol? How many players have to be in a protocol to begin with that you're seeing before a program to even shut down a game? Yeah, it's, a, it's, seven, yeah, it's seven scholarship players, and I believe it's two coaches uh, that, that, that have to uh, – that's the minimum that you have to be able to have. Uh, so, um, oh, so that's why it's a little surprising, but, you know, that tells you the volume of uh, positive tests going on that this many teams – um, you know, uh, the release doesn't say the Marquette and Georgetown games have been postponed uh, due to health and safety, safety protocols. Typically, the releases will say which team has the issue. Now, St. John's game against Butler got canceled because of St. John's issues because they had two more guys in Coburn and Soriano um, uh, get get uh, uh, come up with the virus. So my guess is that 
more guys than just those two came up with it. But it, it's it's very hard to know uh, exactly whose issues they were. Um, and um, but but look, I, I think that uh, we are in a position where uh, all leagues and teams should be in a position where they they should pivot. So if Marquette is is completely okay and they have 10, 11 guys ready, they should play whoever else had opponents canceled just like last year and just play each other. So and uh, don't worry about gamesmanship or pivoting and whoever whoever is good just turn around and play. And uh don't worry about it because uh, the games I think it's more the most valuable thing is that the games get in rather than some of the gamesmanship we saw last year where teams would deliberately either come back slowly. Uh, usually they would come back a little slowly. Uh, I thought there was a little gamesmanship going on where teams would say, okay, no, we're going to try to come back and be ready for this opponent rather than this opponent because if we come back against the better team, we're going to lose. So we want to come back against the more, the lesser opponent. I think there was a lot of that taking place uh, last year. Well, you know, Steve Dombrowski at, at St. John's, uh, you know, he might want to you know, get a copy of this, but I don't, I don't want to send anybody over to St. John's, but I got to ask you this because you're there. Mike Anderson pre-pandemic, you know, he, it was a little tough for him. Now this pandemic, I mean, what do you think his his job security is like? I, I feel like you're on the around the team enough to answer that. Oh yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I, th- I think, and it's very hard to to judge coaches uh, right now uh, because. Uh, you just, you know, what is what is the roster makeup uh, right now? How, how, mu- how much of a stall there is? That's why we saw so few coaches get let go uh, after the 2020. I think, the, I think the number was only seven Division One men's coaches got, got fired after the 2020 season. Uh, 21, uh, there were more that, that got let go. Uh, so, um, uh, w- w- which also was a slight, slightly bit of a head scratcher because there were uh, so many, so many more virus issues compared to the 2020. Now, 2020 was more about saving money and not buying out expensive coaches, uh, because you know you're going to bring on a new coach and then have no July recruiting period, or you know you're really handcuffing them. So, so it, it is very, very difficult to judge uh, right now. Um, uh, some of these programs that just uh, are going to go stop and start, stop and start. Uh, it's it just, it's simply unfair, uh, from, from that perspective. Uh, so, um, uh, and, and also the difference from your opponents that play, that you're playing are, um, depending on what areas of the country they are in, uh, they are just so much more, they have less stoppages than you do. Uh, so it's really not an even playing field in conferences like the Big East that, uh, that have schools all over the place compared to, let's say, Division Two, II, Division Three, where everybody is a little bit more in the same boat. Yeah, geographically, this thing is a nightmare based on where you are, and that's also impacting the NCAA. All right, I want to get back to Ralph. Ralph ben Narchik is joining me here on Adapting to Alex Garrett. You mentioned the car ride from Hostos to the Fork, but you also do games, I think you mentioned Stony Brook. So tell us exactly where you announce, where people hear you uh, if they're listening to this interview right now uh, and are familiar with the voice. Well, I mean, you know, the, the, the simplest way to say not to bore people is kind of, uh, everywhere and a little bit of a little bit of everywhere too. Where you know uh, the main places would be, of course, uh, St. John's Athletics on their ESPN3 and RedStoneSports.com streaming. I'm the Rutgers Women's Basketball Radio guy, uh, so there. Uh, so that's on uh, 1510 Fox Sports Radio in Jersey, and obviously streaming. I'll do um, uh, Big Ten Plus games of, uh, of various sports. January 1st, I have the Rutgers men's game, um, which I hope happens too. Uh, which is a Big Ten Plus uh, game. So uh, all over there, um, uh, New Jersey City University, I'll do streams there in PA. Even Tech, same thing, I'll do PA and mainly streams. You know, I filled in once, just as I said, on, uh, at Stony Brook, uh, on the PA announcer for uh, the New York Red Bulls and Gotham FC at, over at Red Bull Arena. Uh, so on and on it goes. I do NCAA, like three to four NCAA championships a year for the NCAA, you know, that are Division II, Division Three national championships. So uh, on and on it goes that way. So I, I try to keep my calendar as busy as possible because I love what I do. I really feel like I'm catching you on a rare day off, judging by what you just told me. So um, I know you'd be working, and I'm, I'm gra- grateful that you spend the time with us here 
I'd have to, you know, hear this podcast. But thank you, Rob, uh, for that. Okay, so all of that being said, I want to get to what where we met, which was actually CUNY Athletics has begun. I think it's been a couple of years in now. Wheelchair basketball, and as I mentioned earlier, you've done all these sports. What's it like calling a wheelchair basketball game, and how how much of a rhythm, a different rhythm, do you have to have than when you're doing, say, a St. John's game? And how do you adapt to that? I'm just curious. Uh, well, yeah. I, 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 Actually, I had broadcast wheelchair basketball once before already in uh, 2015. It was like a New York City Mayor's Cup um, wheelchair basketball event. It was a tournament uh, that I happened to randomly, you know, uh, they were looking for somebody, so I did it. Uh, so I had already seen it. Um, and, um, you know, really the rules are mainly the same. Uh, there's a couple of small subtleties in terms of the rules that are a little bit different. But other than that, that doesn't take much adjustment. And, um and, and at the end of the day, it's still a basketball game. The concepts are still mainly the same. You know, there's more picking, you know, like there's more off-ball picking. Like there's really no such thing as a moving screen. It's more like there's almost like football where there's more downfield blocking uh, where you're trying to keep, uh, create advantages uh, uh, that way. So, like, there is no such thing really as a moving screen, uh, really, in wheelchair basketball. There's very little of that. There's more picking like all fall. Otherwise it's still basketball. There's still athletes that put in a lot of time and energy to be really good. And uh, a couple times, I mean, you know, when you broadcast up close, uh, you know, the average right-handed layup that we take for granted, uh, the layups that they shoot on the move while rolling, uh, that's not the easiest shot, you know, and, and you know, you, you figure a right-handed layup uh, for a, uh, a regular basketball player has to be a 90% type shot, right. In, in a, uh, uh, basically, a an uncontested right-handed layup has got to be a 90% shot, and in wheelchair basketball, it's, it's not it's not the, it's not the easiest thing. They have to get really good at it. Um, so that's something, one of the things that I really appreciate. That now that I've done a couple of uh, CUNY wheelchair basketball double headers. And uh, what's it like for CUNY to expand? Because you've been with them for a while now, haven't you? Yeah, since 2008, I've broadcast CUNY championships. So yeah, I, I didn't mention them, but you know, I could have mentioned them and bunch of other stuff. I mean, you know, CUNY has been awesome and uh, a lot of great memories, a lot of great games that I've done. And so when they expanded to include wheelchair basketball, what, what was your first take? I think it's a pretty ingenious idea, to be honest with you. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the bigger picture, I mean, uh, they have a great guy first running it and Ryan Martin, who played for the New York Rolling Knicks. And he's got a tremendous background, but not just as a player, but as a person and organizer. Like, uh, he, he really wants it to be, and he and like, I think CUNY saw that there was a... Uh, uh, just the need in the metro area to basically have an adapted sports team. You know, the way there's others in um, in other parts of the country, like Illinois, Edinburgh, and Pennsylvania, and some other places uh, that have these teams, but New York did not have one uh, for, um, you know, for kids or college students to go to. So they said, well, let's make a, a conference-wide team. Uh, there was a need for it, and, uh, and uh, he really wants to build it up where uh, – uh, where there's going to, you know, I think someday he, he would want it to be where there's going to be a, a women's coach, head coach too, and a separate men's coach too, where they're really built up to that standpoint. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's definitely a great idea, and it's something that um, it just gives another outlet and the more attention it gets. I mean, Ryan, I think, is, you know, he's actively recruiting and looking for players so that I think his dream is that they have 12 men's players, 12 women's players, and they're all truly college students and uh, to build an empire uh, that way, and it you know pr- provides an opportunity for the tri-state area uh, for all those kids that have uh, uh, any kind of disabilities uh, to have to, to have a place to play sports. And it's uh, they are passionate, man. And I, I've actually been fortunate to get to know uh, Malki and Destiny. Malki on the men's team, Destiny on the women's team, and uh, from the Viscardi School and Joe Salonica. So shout out to them and shout out to Zach and Mike Sporton, who I've known for about uh, 10 years or so. I mean, you joined in 08. I went to Queens in 09. So it's kind of an interesting uh, intersect there, Ralph. So that, it's it's fun. And uh, the more you do, the more fun it's going to be. I, I assure you that. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, – I'm, I'm very fascinated uh, on uh, January 22nd to see what the you know great teams are at, from uh, Edinburgh and Illinois – because they play in a doubleheader at Queens College that day that I'll be broadcasting. So I'm very curious to see what the very top of the sport 
you know, at the college level looks like. But I, I just saw the New York rolling mix, so I saw, you know, what the top of the sport looks like with a couple of their players too. But, uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, there's a whole other world that's very organized and, and, um, and uh, you know, just as, uh, uh, just as competitive as any high-level Division I team in any sport is. Let me ask you this, because the, from an outsider perspective, someone seeing this might say, well, they're inspirational. But the coolest thing is these guys don't want to be considered inspirational. They just want to win, right? So it's a very interesting dynamic. Oh, yeah, yeah. The no, look, they, they, these are all, oh, yeah, these are all, you know, athletes that that, that are competing. I mean, to some extent. And uh, and I think, the, I think the goal is that they just don't want to play for fun. Uh, they want the mentality to be that if you get recruited, you are there. Uh, and there are expectations to win. Uh, they just don't want it to be like an intramural team. That's not the point at all. Uh, that you know, they don't exist that way to be intramurals. Like I know the you know Illinois and the Edinburgh teams, they don't exist in uh, you know adaptive sports to just you know be intramural. Um, I, I think they I think they want people to be upset if they lose. Uh, that's the whole. Uh, that's the standard that they're trying to create. Right. Well, and of course the Illinois Illini. I mean, the Illini. That's that's a, a D1 program d- dipping into this. And could you see more Division ones pick up and and dip into this uh, adaptive sports market, if you will? Uh, yeah. I, I don't know if I don't know if um, uh, I don't know what the data is. I mean, how many people are, you know are, that are qualified? You know, uh, that would fit that category. I mean, I hope there aren't that many. Uh, disabled kids in the future that uh, you know that have to go that way. Uh, so um, you know, but I just think that they want to have um, at least CUNY realizes that there is definitely a, a hole in this area where um, any any young kid that, that loves sports there is a path to play the sport at a very competitive level through college, and I think that's what that, that's that's what they want to do. I mean, um, you know, geez, down the road can another college pick it up? Sure, I think that it is possible. Um, I know that the University of Illinois uh, wheelchair basketball team is like the first one, and they were formed something like in 1948. So uh, I haven't researched when the other ones did, but uh, I wonder who the Illinois team played, you know, in 1948 and, you know, through the 50s, 60s, before it, it really got going. So, um, so at, at least regionally, there should be at least one in every kind of area because the next closest one is um, college team. There's Edinburgh. There's Team CUNY, and then you have to go down to Charlotte, North Carolina. There's another college team. So that's still that's obviously uh, so at, at least until they fill in regional holes, you can't even think about more colleges doing it. I'll tell you what. Maybe you'll have the ear of the red storm one day. That would be kind of interesting if they decided to go into this because I think a lot of I don't know what the disabled community is on St. John's, but I feel like a lot of people would be interested in doing this uh, if they decide to expand. So who knows? You know, that's, that's for them there. All right, you mentioned, Ralph, uh, soccer. You do Red Bulls. And I think I asked you this in the car, right? I, I said, what did NYCFC look like? Did they look like a team that could win the MLS Cup as they just did? Uh, yeah, they're a classic example of a team that was always capable, but they got hot at the right time. Uh, look, they had to win a huge road, you know, road championship game and a tough environment at Portland. Uh, that's the, uh, the classic case of a, uh, of a, uh, and, and of course they had to go through New England and they had to win uh, twice in penalties, you know, against uh, against New England and against Portland. So uh, they just, you know, ride a, they just put together just a magical, magical carpet ride and Cinderella run. They were very good, but uh, they just were able to ride it through uh, where they were already of quality, and then they got enough breaks that landed their way. And I'll tell you what, I mean, I don't know the names as well as I, I used to. I mean, David Villa, I, I know he was around there for a while when they first started and whatnot, but I do know that it is interesting. They are the champions in the Bronx for the first time in about 12 years now, so it's just funny that they are the ones, and good for them, and maybe – you can comment on this. Is soccer having a rise in New York um, more so than a few years ago, even? Oh yeah, I think it is. Yeah, I, I, no doubt. I mean, there's just uh, there's just so much soccer uh, being played at the youth level. Uh, so uh, I, I think you know now anybody the age of 20 is familiar with soccer compared to the pre 
previous generation that just uh, soccer just wasn't uh, their mindset. But you know, it, it, they know it takes it takes a full generation for a sport to kind of uh, uh, blossom and then to to build a fan base. You know, you have to engage you know uh, engage fans when they're very young, and then eventually when they have their own money and their own families, and and, and they start and they start to pass that along. Yeah, that's what it takes to build a fan base. You know, fan bases don't. Um, in a sport like soccer, they don't get built up automatically, uh, you know, generally not. Like, you, you really need to build a, kind of a soccer community. Uh, some markets has worked out better than others, like Portland, uh, be, but because they don't, they don't have a lot of pro sports, so they jumped on it. In a place like New York, where there's so many entertainment options in, in a non-pandemic world, uh, it, it's, it's going to take a, a full generation. Well, I believe City Field is going to have their own team or the Met. The- there's some team coming to Queens, isn't, isn't there, I was reading? Uh, well, uh, no, NYCFC is going to split their games between Yankee Stadium, Red Bull, and City Field next year is the, is the early story. So they're going to uh, be, wow. be between all three places. That should be interesting. So now you might get to do some NYCFC, maybe down in Harrison, or they'll bring their own crew. Who knows, right? yeah, they, they, yeah, they have their own people. Yeah, they, they do everything possible to, to basically copy everything they have at City. Uh, at Yankee Stadium over to uh, Red Bull. So, all right, Rob, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you this. Um, I think the big, biggest adaptation for any announcer was doing it from a studio. And so, uh, to, to kind of bookend this conversation, can you see that going back to the studio while it's Omicron's bearing down on us? And, and what was that experience like to begin with? Uh, I definitely can see it happening again. Uh, no question. Uh, I would say that uh, beginning probably with these upcoming college basketball road trips and even some of these college football uh, championship games, you know, going on, all these big bowls, I wouldn't be surprised if we heard about all those radio guys that will travel with teams that do do those games remotely. Uh, not at all. Um, and uh, I did a couple of games off the monitor last year. Uh, and it was fine, but it's still not the same as being as being you know in attendance in person. Uh, you just you just miss the sights and sounds, and and uh, it, it's still not the same. You know, it's it's very doable, uh, but uh, you still miss. There's there's nothing like being at the game. No, and the gut wrench of seeing the empty stands everywhere last year. You don't want to go back. We don't want to go back to that. And with people being vaccinated, there, there's no reason to go back to that, as far as I'm concerned, if I can add a little editorial there. Uh, yeah, I mean, nothing would surprise me if, uh, I mean, we're already seeing fan restriction, so it wouldn't surprise me if we go to a, uh, a non-fan, let's say, you know, kind of game by game, where, uh, where, where places say, uh, you know what, um, you know, no fans for the next two games, something like that. Uh, I would I would not be surprised if uh, or if the Knicks say you know what we're limiting to 50% capacity for our next three home games or something like that. Well, we'll have to see if the we pray not, but we'll have to see what happens as this thing uh, keeps, as I say, bearing down on us. But Ralph, in the meantime, thanks so much for joining us. And uh, I know you like politics. We get into that another time, but I wanted people to just get to know you and who Ralph Benerchik is. I know you been accomplished and been around the, the sports scene. So thanks for spending time with us uh, here on Alex Garrett Podcasting. Alex, it is absolutely my pleasure. And uh, I will probably be uh, out there on the January 22nd. We'll have to see if that works out for uh, the CUNYAC games. I, I'd love to be out there with you guys. So we'll see. Yeah, me too. I, I hope that those games happen. Uh, and uh, look, we're all taking it day by day. Uh, we're right now we're in, a, we're in a mode, especially in New York City, where um, you can plan stuff on paper, uh, but don't necessarily count on anything happening. Just worry, put plan things on paper, but just worry about tomorrow. That's the motto. Amen to that. All right, Ralph, thanks again. And uh, where can people find you, by the way? Social media is. Uh, yeah, just, where, find, where, yeah, where just, 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 just Google me, Ralph Dinorchik. You'll find me on Facebook and start from there. Very cool. All right, Ralph, thanks again. And uh, I'm Alex Skirt where we're always adapting.